to speak with and hear from the artists in a moment. But first, there's a little surprise that some of the students have prepared to welcome you. Uh, we are going to hear a uh, spoken word performance of some of the poetry that is in the space that we will be performed by Iraq. And so without further ado, I will welcome the students who will give us a performance, after which we'll have a tough opportunity to speak with the artists and then continue to enjoy this beautiful work. So let's welcome the Iraq. Hi, we're um, Iraq, also known as Ebony Readers Onyx Theater. We're spoken word group here on campus. Um, and we're basically here to read the poems of Carol Bean um, that you can also find all around the gallery. And I would encourage you after we do this reading to um, really focus on the words and really look at them. I think the poems are beautiful. So I'm just it lingers in the air, unaccustomed memory, raw with recollecting river roads and dry salt seabeds, waterways on which dry leaves tinge with sunset's blood. Now eddy in the wind, we pick up stones smooth and ripe with secrets, and each of we calls out a name. I smell the water through the desert sands and dry, cheerless eyes. Hot winds ripple waves, voiding footprints and other signs of presence. Cries of seabirds feeding fill my ears, raucous celebrations of perpetual movement, voyages of return and farewells, presaging departures. Who will give the sands their liberation of blood? Who will feed water to the sun and offer self for safe passage? When do you know that it's time to leave? It was the day we walked on water through lightning and filled our bodies with new mysteries. It was the day we looked into the sun beyond walls that dissolved into brilliant, blinding mists through which only we could see. It was the day the doors laid down before us and locks flew into the sky before plummeting into the sea. It was the day of sweet release, of passing over into return, of come dance with me into the days of long nights and almost forever. It was the day we walked with lightning through our water and filled our bodies with the sun. It was the day the walls dissolved into the mist of noon that only we, blinded by the brilliance, could see. It was the day the doors and the locks doing penitence did throw themselves into the sea. It was the day of release, of sweetly passing over into return, and come dance with me through the long nights and days of almost forever. It was the day. It was the day. It was the day. We rise to new light, soft as mist on the valley. 
Calm as morning, serene as still water, wearing sweet grass, wild cherry and healing willow. We shall walk our rivers to freedom and make voyages of return. We lift up our eyes. The strength of the light is in us and through us, dancing, red dirt beneath our feet. Benediction of clouds, opening chasms in the sky, raising high winds, immersing us in storm light. We stand always on the transforming edges of destruction, crumpled vessels, confounding forms, explosions mark our sight of being. Seagulls cry and circle. They know, they too know the secrets and our stories. Once was a riverbed, dry in the season, where some gathered small round stones at high noon and washed them in the sun shadows. Polished them with sunlight and fine grit and washed them once again with solemn words, tears. They be extracted from earth's marrow, their own. That morning so smelling of December, tied up in a special cloth of memory and held close to our chest with a fistful of dirt, carry far, consoling weight. Mine I string on remembrance, pearls, black with night, glistening with moon, and with pain. Our grief, our joys, shards of reflections in ancient mirrors broken in these times. The sadness in the autumn light casts long shadows of hands outstretched to touch objects filled with spirits that the wind brings us on the quiet sounds of afternoon deepening into twilight, into the silence of when all the birds have ceased that day to sing, a leather box used to hold monies collected to buy freedom papers, a headpiece of finely woven grass and feathers and cowrie shells, knowing moments, then refracting now more than memory. No strangers to boundary street. We stand before the house on this land of deep wounds, healing, where echoes gather and sometimes nightmares, eyes closed to better remember your long gone faces, we are come to witness for the laying of hands in visitation. Stories at the waterhole, those that could be told, clouds tangled with remnants of moon, morning light on damp red sand, finer than seconds of the day, imprints of the tracks of insects and birds, of, sliver, of slitherings and small burrowing <coughs> animals, all that remains of their nights of feeding, insinuation of presence. We saw water holes, mere wondrous glints of light, sustaining trees and grasses. We saw only rocks and crevices and the stark shadows of cave entrances. They, the beginning and endings of stories, all signifying marks and spaces. However did the stolen children hold fast to their dream? How did they recall and claim their dream time did not? Continuation of um, 
a show I did at Hampton University. Uh, what was that, early? Early last, year. early last year. Most of the work I do is, I'm working on something right now. Uh, I usually, I started that piece, the piece before, so it's, it's a continuation, especially if, if the piece before worked out all right, you turn around and try to do it again, but you can't repeat it. Um, so uh, you, what, you, what you heard, a lot of these pieces are about were, uh, Australia. Uh, we went to our, had a show in Australia a couple years ago, and Australia really um, fascinated me. Not just because of the Aborigines, uh, and, you know, black people go over there, the first thing you want to see is black people. <laughs> but trying to see the black people in Australia is it's like trying to see the Native American Indians when you, when you come in. You got to make it a mission. Uh, but Australia says, when we left Australia, it just said, come back. I mean, it really says, come back. And um, the most fascinating part about the, uh, the, the trip was we went to this place called Uluru, this, this magical rock, red rock that comes out of the ground. Uh, the dirt over there in Australia is red. If you're from the east coast of Washington, D.C., or anywhere on the east coast, red dirt equals Georgia. You know, so that's, that's the connection right there. But they have a lot of uh, very simple stories that explain very complicated things about life. Uh, and that's, that's one thing I like. They're the very simple storytelling. So when, when most of these pieces, I can tell you a story, uh, but the stories always come Last. The most important thing is I want to capture, I want to capture your brain. I want you to look at the piece and think about what the hell is he thinking about? What does that mean? <laughs> Once I got you there, then uh, the possibility of the story can always come up. Uh, the impact of the image is always the most important thing for me. Uh, I don't know what these pieces mean a lot of times until after it's done. A lot of times until way after it's done. Uh, it's just a matter of creating, putting different Photographic images together trying to create a little bit of magic and a little name the dish after someone else eats it. Uh, I'd like to thank the two uh, young women who read my poetry. It's always an interesting experience hearing your words coming out of someone else's mouth. Uh, and that was really very, very, very moving. I guess when Michael and I worked together with our uh, with my poetry and his images. It's a collaboration we try not, he doesn't illustrate my words, and I don't write specifically to his poems, although the longer we do it, the more there's a kind of a conflation of uh, intention and effort. And the first time we, we did this, I had a body of work, he had a body of work, and that, that has become more intermingled, the whole process. Uh, he might show me an image, and I'll be taken by a certain part of it, and then I may take that and it may come out in a way I'm not doing it deliberately, trying thinking of that specific thing, but when I read the whole poem or when I look at the two things together, then uh, I see the connections. And so it's very enriching to have those extra layers added. For me, I think it's, I'm more of a word person. Uh, I'm also a very visual person, and I, I think my efforts in, in creating poems are to give very vivid uh, visual sort of touchstones with the words so that you can stand in front of poetry and read that and have that resonate with, some, with an experience of your own, something that you've seen. I uh, always remember the first time I showed, because I was a closet poet for a very long time, and uh, Michael and DC poet friend of his, Gaston Neal, and Daryl Stover, Stover, who some of you, um, you know, probably know, were among those first people whom I allowed myself to feel secure enough to write, to begin showing my writing to other people. And so sticking my neck out in terms of writing and then proposing collaborations with, uh, with other artists and certainly working with Michael has been some, it's an ongoing process. And I think that when you're around visual artists particularly, or if you're around music people, you become even more aware of sort of the aesthetics and the essence of their disciplines. Uh, I have the experience of a poem that I, um, that's not here, but I'd written a long time ago uh, at, at an exhibition in California, I read it. And so the brother of a friend says, that's fantastic, why don't you come to my sound studio and uh, we'll tape it. Okay, I 
get there. And he says, well, so when you read these words, what sounds do you hear? I'm going, what sounds do I hear? You know, because at that point, I wasn't hearing any sound. They're the obvious ones. But then as he talked about you know, his craft and his art and the very sort of sensitive ability that he had to sort of pull things out, you know, I began to take that more into account also, I think, as, as I write. So. So that's it. Um, this is a, there are pieces in here that I don't have poems for yet, I say. This is one piece. This was taken in Paris, France, the way Michael works, and will paint the model, and then she get, he or she gets relocated in a different context based on where we've traveled. And so this is actually a combination of Australia. You can see the grasses here. Uh, I think these two, if I'm not mistaken, the basins are probably produced in the state penitentiary, the sort of scare house in Philadelphia, which is a ruin, and then this very elaborate uh, dome and superstructure that comes from one of uh, Paris's premier galleries to where you can go and spend money and look up and see an, an amazing Tiffany dome of Tiffany glass. So there, there are colors, there are, there are sounds, all of these things kind of come together, and then this, this lone figure there. So I know that I don't have a poem for that. Um, seven Seven is another piece that I feel very strongly about in the corner. I know I don't have a poem for that, and I say yet. And then there were some poems, the poem, the poem right here it was the day. This is one that when the, there wasn't room for everything, and so when the piece that that went with Plan A was one that was retired from the exhibition, but I really wanted that poem to be in. I said, well, let's see, what do, I, what do we have here that that could go with? So in a sense, I cheated a bit. <laughs> this uh, image is taken in a, from a jail in Maitland, uh, Australia. And a lot, of, a lot of my work deals with sort of loss and trying to reconstitute, re we impose the presence of the people and the spirit whom you feel live there uh, or who occupy those spaces. And so this, you have these series of, of images here. Now the space was originally like a wreck area in the prison. It was, a, it was, o it was open uh, to the elements and so the prisoners were able to spend an hour or two hours or whatever amount of time was allowed outside. Then, uh, in later times, it became a center for drama. And so it was converted. So all of a sudden, it's a theater space where the prisoners were presenting things. And now, it's a municipal place where tourists go. And so in each of these, sort of the lives of this space has provided an opportunity for people to speak in their own voices, perhaps, when I, when I think and when I imagine the people who lived there before, particularly when uh, Australia was still very much uh, the 19th century and early 20th century, when things were definitely not good. And a lot of the, a lot of the people who were imprisoned there were uh, Aboriginal people, and many times for minor infractions. The original poem was one that I wrote in response to an image that Michael had for uh, a space that had been an asylum for colored women in Maryland outside the district. And I didn't know that that was the purpose of that particular building. I just saw the image that he had done for the three figures sort of moving out of the frame of the, uh, of the print. And so I wrote this poem. And then he told me after the fact that that's what the space was. And that kind of gave me goosebumps. And so I wrote, I wrote this poem. This piece here, uh, one thing I like about it is it's something that I always do, even though I don't have, if I don't have a subject matter in mind. I very seldom do I go out to shoot people, and I, I don't know why. Maybe that's a, just a thing about when they give me the real truth about the point of thing. Look, I don't know how to do that yet. Uh, all the people that I shoot, I shoot in the studio. So what I do when I go out to shoot, I will shoot textures, and I will shoot places to put people in. Uh, and for some strange reason, uh, Never been to jail. Mm -hmm. I'm from the woods. Like, hey, you don't have to do anything wrong to go to jail. <laughs> they pick you, you will go. You know, uh, but the idea of being confined is, 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 is always just fascinating to me. Uh, and I've shot prisons that were changed over to art centers 
or just defunct prisons. I mean, you go in there, you just, I mean, you see these, you see these cages that, that are strong enough to hold the rhinoceros, a, a, a DC suit. And I can just see a little skinny ass, little Tyrone in that jail. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, who they make these things for? And then you look on the walls, and you, I, I, I shot this prison, the DC jail, uh, Lawton, and uh, Hobart Street Gang, which is right where I used to live. He, the word on the wall, it was a little gang that from the crack days that started in my neighborhood. It was, it was right there on the wall. Then you, um, when you go to uh, Ghana, we went to uh, Accra, and I call them slave castles. Uh, they, had, they had this one little pen that reminded me of a little pen that they had in Lawton. It's for the badasses. That person is always separate. But those jails always feel the same. You know, you don't, you don't want to be there. You just don't want to be there. But what happens when you can find that? Um, I mean, you stay there long enough, you start seeing things. You know? One of the most fascinating jail I, I, I shot was the Eastern Penitentiary in, in Philadelphia. It's uh, in the middle of Philadelphia. It's a ruin. Uh, I don't think Americans have it, had too many ruins. If we build things, as soon as it gets old, tear it, suck it down, and put a new one up. Uh, but this one, they let stay there. It's, it's kind of like a place where uh, Boris Karloff will come out of, the, out, of, out of the corner of the wall somewhere. It's a big, <laughs> dreary looking place. And I think, what the hell is that? It's a prison. You know, it's, uh, it used to be the most modern prison in the United States. They had running water before the White House had. Built by the Quakers, yeah. I think in the 1820s something. But they had this thing with you, no matter what your offense was, you was in that in your little home for uh, 23 hours out of a day. Mm. You know, you was there. And uh, so what they did when it, it got too rough, and uh, it, it was in function all the way up to uh, in the 70s. And they just they didn't let it go. I mean, they, in some prisons, some of the cells they had trees growing out of. And they, uh, some of them still had the beds in them. I mean, and they had one light source, a skylight, and a little door. And it, it's, if you know anything about photography, it's hard to come up with a bad picture if you got one big light source, you know, so the perfect pictures. And uh, you can't help but just feeling all this light that used to be there. And a couple of cells, they had this, it's like this barber's chair, big red barber's chair sitting in the middle of it. Now how that survived, I don't know, but that's just, story that, that, that should be told. Uh, this gallery in Lafayette, this, this, this space, it's, uh, it's, it's like a cathedral, but it's, it's, it's a block, as big as a block. And then you go, you go in there and you, you expect to see all these different stores. No, this is one store. It's just overwhelming, overwhelming space. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's and I, the space got me, grabbed me. Other spaces they they grabbed me. Uh, dilapidated churches, churches when they when they when they crumble. Old buildings, uh, especially when they leave things around. And before the graffiti artists get in there and screw up every damn thing, you know, it's, it's hard to get a real space without the graffiti artists attacking it first. Uh, and they just make me feel like there's life back in there. But when I do in the studio, I somehow in the I create the models in the studio and I tell the story uh, by putting the model back in this empty dead space. And thank God for Photoshop. <laughs> you know, that's, that's my tool. I love Photoshop. Questions? Yeah. Uh, Question. Yeah. Questions? I especially uh, want to thank the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for bringing some of my native Washingtonians down here. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it takes the rough edges off of having been down here for the time that I've been here. But more importantly, uh, uh, first with you, Mike, I remember when you did the installation for uh, Garth Tate's right. performance poetry piece, Full Moon, which was my entree, I guess you could say, into performance in, in D.C. Uh, my question to you goes back to what you were sharing with us about process um, and the fact that you did say Photoshop, but I, I see several things happening here between sense of place and individual or groups. And so I wanted to, to get a sense of, you know, what, what, what contributes to getting a single person in one sense and a multiplicity of people in 
another. And for you, Carol, I, I just wanted to say that uh, yeah, your poetry has always amazed me for several reasons. And there's something that I'm seeing in this, and it's two things that are running together, freedom and rivers. And I'm just wondering where those items may come from. Is it just a single set of experiences or one? Our freedom here in America or the freedom that we saw in Australia or the freedom that could possibly exist in prison spaces? But those are my two questions I wanted to toss at you. Well, um, a lot of times I think we, we basically, we paint, we draw, or we recite the same point over our life period. Uh, I'm a figurative person. Started out drawing, painting, and uh, etching. And most of the time, it was a figure, got figure ground relationship, just one figure in a space. And I would say everything through that one figure in the space. So when I decided to do this um, a digital stuff, everything again was, again, back, one figure in a space. Um, you might ask yourself, why are they all women? Well, I said, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I love women, you know. But when I was in undergrad school, every drawing class for four years, it was the Columbus College of Art and Design, uh, every drawing class, every painting class was this new female. And uh, you did that for two years, and it dawned on you, how come the upper class ain't doing this? They're doing what they want to do. Mm -hmm. But the teachers never told you. Mm -hmm. So you had to come up with something to get rid of boredom out of your own head so you could even get into do your own artwork in the classroom. Okay. Uh, the, the single figures eventually evolved. You know, a lot of times you go into the studio and you ask them, the mom asks, what are we doing today? I, throw my hands, I don't know what we're doing today. Uh, after I painted, I said, we're jumping today. I said, high your knees. And she said, well, my knees. She said, my knees. <laughs> so I would have her jump up, and I would lay on the floor and shoot up. That automatically um, made the figure feel like it was, the person was flying. Then I eventually put this circle on the, the, uh, the person uh, that reminds me of a hula hoop. And that became like a hovercraft. And the hula hoop was the, the, uh, the hoop that you jump through. The people make you do things before you become of age. And the hula hoop also became the, the craft. Then uh, I also had this thing about what goes up comes down. But now the circle was on the ground. So again, I had the model do, do one pose and just keep turning. Then somehow or another, I can make that one model feel like it's a, a crowd of people. And that's how that whole thing developed. So it, it, I can, my, my tent is not the same person. But if you look at it, it's a bunch of people. I guess for me, the rivers and the, and the freedom thing, I think it's more water. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it just happens to be rivers, but it also. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I find that water is associated a lot of times with healing, mm -hmm. with destruction, but also many, many times with healing. And obviously, you can't live without it. And I guess I remember coming back from uh, a trip to Europe, and we had visited a water museum. And, and one thing that really struck me was when they uh, said, most people cannot go beyond three days without water. Food, you can last longer, but no water, and that's it. And this was the time as my mother was dying. And so she lasted maybe about 10 days after we got back, but that kind of stuck in my head. And then I, I don't know that I go to the water deliberately, but um, Michael has done a series of, of prints dealing with the Underground Railroad. We have some friends who live on the eastern shore of Maryland. And so that's all been very much a part of it. We went to a, a, for a wildlife reserve called Black, Black River Forest, I think. And just driving around that landscape, particularly certain kind, times of the day, you can't help but think of people who are trying to leave that area and get north, get you know, go to freedom. And also, when you're in the water, you feel Really good most of the time. <laughs> Carol's a fish. She loves yeah. to swim. She would go to the pool 15 minutes before the pool closes just to get that little 10 minutes in that water. Mm -hmm. She loves water. Yeah. But, but also, as a, you know, a, a, there's another theme that's there that's sort of loss and pain. And I think loss and pain are both. There's a, the water is a bomb mm -hmm. uh, and it helps you get to the next day, get, get through the next day. 
um, and move on from things. So there's this constant, this continuity you know, movement. Those are probably those two points coming together for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We, we, we teach school a lot. This always happens yeah. at schools. As soon as we end up here, everybody will come up and ask you a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's phenomenal. I don't know why that happens. Can we walk around and then ask you questions? Sure. And go with you as well. And how much would you say one of these pieces costs for a friend? So the big pieces are 5000 Okay. And uh, A good friend. A good, a good friend. <laughs> Uh, everything, I, that's one thing I've learned. Uh, when, I, when I went to uh, the Africa, everything is negotiable. <laughs> everything. Well, yeah. Everything is negotiable. Yeah. Uh, so we invite folks to, to, to walk around, we're going to let you lead us around, and we'll come with you, and you can talk about it. I also have some smaller pieces here. You have small pieces? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, this piece right here on the wall here.
call that cutie pie. This is um, uh, in, Oxford, in Maitland. Uh, this is uh, the, the, near the last day we were riding around because I saw this huge uh, barn that was being torn down. That would be going to have a fire and caved in. But the barn was the same shape that flew through. Uh, I mean, you just, just saw it. You just saw the shape. So I took a, a, real, I took a real nice photograph of uh, the barn. So I think it was one of the better straight photographs I did. But I, I went to put a ceremony around that. So I came up with that idea. Here's the, the circle in the same model, just turning, turning around. And the thing with the, this is the ritual part of the thing. Uh, Sometimes when you see people and you're staring at them, you know, somewhere you keeping your head, it's not quite the same thing. You can't stand them, you just look away, you know. So if these people caught me standing like that. So what I had to ask people had this thing about it's almost like uh, being in the woods. This is a set of woods that were out and around. We used to call it G-Men Diamond. And you walk around in the, in, in the woods and there's a great big clearing at the top. At the playing at the top, uh, we used to play baseball, football. And, but what happened if you walked up there at the top of the woods and you saw a ceremony going on? I mean, you, you, the last thing I would do is, hey, what y'all doing over there? <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't do that. I would hide out. Hide out, because uh, once I make myself, my parents are known, they might stop. Uh, this is. Can I ask you yeah. about this? So one of the things that uh, I'm going to have to tell you that I worked on this with you, at least putting it on the wall and looking at everything and watching it, and I forgot all about Australia mm -hmm. and the notion of dream time and the way that uh, they can go through these particular rituals and it allows them to live in another time that's out of time or a, a totally different counting of time from us. So the idea of, of ritual and over time, or ritual and, and practice and whatever, creating the possibilities for people to travel in time. That's very, very, very good happen. point. There is this uh, Australian movie, uh, uh, the last one I seen, uh, which is it blew me away. It's all, called Ten Canoes. Yeah. Ten yeah. Canoes. It's yeah. We showed it here too. Very, it's very complicated. It's, it's exactly. very elaborate. It's, Right. Don't ever mess with another man's wife. Right. <laughs> very, very simple story. Yeah. But a very, very how they told that story was was, was fascinating. Uh, this is morning. This is evening ritual. This is morning ritual. This is uh, in uh, uh, Uluru. Uh, I mean, the, the, the only nice thing I like about Australia was sunrise and sunset. I mean, it wasn't a bad one because we were, we stayed on the coast most of the time in the water and. Uh, the sky, and I said, the sky is high. The sky is really high. Sunrise and sunset on Uluru is, you see that the red becomes extra red. And I, I can't foresee somebody not having a, a, a sunrise ceremony. So, uh, that's what this one's about. This is land grab. Uh, you know, they were there first. Uh, but something happened. You know, these other people came there. And they said, I want this. They didn't buy it, they just took it, you know. Uh, in a lot of Australian paintings, you'll see these circles, the center circle. That, that means a uh, water hole. And that was basically the center of the, the group of people who lived there. But they got their water hole with them, it's all good there. But somehow or another, they're trying to come back to take the land back. When we were in Australia, there was a we're in, where were we? Brisbane. Brisbane. There was this big ceremony going on about taking back our land. And uh, it was a, uh, when a few times we saw a large uh, collection of, uh, of um, Australian, Aboriginal people. And, but it, it so much reminded me of what black folks did in the 60s. I mean, it was, it was the same kind of conversation, the exact same kind of conversation. I had a show went over in, uh, in England, and we went to uh, Bristol and Maitland. I heard the same kind of conversation. I felt like it was the 60s all over again, mentally. So I kind of think we should be the black folks in America. We, we started something. I'm not saying we the only person that did it, but uh, it's like they took a model and they, they, they went for it. And you, and you know how to travel, and you see these things. You, you, uh, it's, 
that's new. This one is about um, time walker, time track. Uh, this is one of the few models that did two colors uh, after, after I started painting white. And she's being led down the hallway in, in Philadelphia. There's this one dude, uh, his name is Isaiah Zagar. In south side of Philly, he does these mosaics of these broken ceramics and mirrors, and he decorates things. You know, he'll do your, your front, um, he'll do your front of your house, he'll do the, the side and the alley. But they had a small museum dedicated to him. And in the museum was this long hallway and you walked down. So, uh, my first idea was to use the mosaic as textures. And I saw the hallway represented the space. So I put her in the hallway. Well, who's leading her? This, I forgot exactly where this figure came from. It was uh, from, I uh, lifted it from uh, a sculpture that they had at Hampton University. You know, you know you're not supposed to take pictures of other people's stuff, but I just, we, we lie, we steal, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> so he's leading her down this path. Somewhere. And this, this thing right here at the top is uh, when I was, we were in, um, with Camper. Camper. In Australia, again, they had a show uh, about the um, Egyptian show. Uh, the first Egyptian show that blew my mind was the hit Smithsonian. Uh, and that just, just took my brain and put it on the table. But they, uh, they had the canoes up in the sky. I did a one piece, I did one piece where uh, uh, the young lady was talking around Uluru, giving a lecture about the story around Uluru. And she was pointing this way. And I put the canoes up there, and I said, they came and they're flying canoes. Maybe it has something to do with the, the fire canoes, but the idea of these canoes flying up here, they, they went from this place. Uh, they had other powers, and they gave us Uluru. So she's being led through this place. He's a time walker. This is a uh, concrete. He's <laughs> a, a model. Uh, most of us, we, we heard the term about a brick. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, good like that. You know? yeah, yeah. Very appropriate text. I hope she, she, she don't hear me say this. But. <laughs> She's a very good friend of mine. And, like, uh, and uh, that really began to feel like it was texture that she was wearing. Yeah. And it was not too pleasant. Right. This, is, this is one, when, when you put it up, you appreciate more. When you talk about the, the forms and the figures that you do, this is real. You know what I mean? This mm -hmm. is not uh, a, a, a typical, prototypical, not typical, but prototypical model. This is a real woman. Yeah. This is yeah. a this is someone who exists, at least in my mind. And I think that name sort of fits her. I had one model uh, one modeling experience. Most of these models are students at Howard University. And uh, once the once the word get around that you're paying models, you know, you two hundred dollars. Come over there and sit a little while and eat a little food. All you gotta do is get naked, then take some pictures of you. I can't get two <laughs> Uh, so it wasn't a problem getting models. And uh, again, and also, there are a lot of people still want to participate in that uh, artist model relationship, and, and that, that constantly goes on in Western history. Uh, but I had this one model come up, uh, came over. She was a, a six footer and weighed close to 300 pounds. She's a big, big woman. And uh, I met her through her sister, who was a little skinny little thing in the dance department at Howard. And I had another model, they, 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 they danced together. And uh, so her sister was showing in Chicago another model uh, some work that we, we did. And Janella was sitting there in the chair. I like this. Yeah, I really like this. I really like this a lot. I really like this. And, uh, but I knew they were leaving the next day. So I started talking a little trash. I said, well, well you know, you had a little more time. I could hook you all up. <laughs> so I kept talking trash. And uh, she kept saying, I like this. He said, right now. <laughs> I thought that. I grabbed my sandwich. I grabbed my heart. But like the, uh, not that, 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 I do think it was such a way where they, they are real people. They have, to, they have to feel like real people or they represent something 
bigger than what they are. I think that one of the interesting things about the different models uh, is the kind of relationship and trust that you see in the sort of artist, the final uh, relationship, and also the comfort level, particularly in the States, with people dealing with big women, big, big people, all right? And so, for example, that image was kind of, people were very wary of it um, in, a, in a faculty show. And in Paris, there's absolutely no problems. And everybody sort of gravitated to that particular image, those, that series that I've ever done with this young woman to see, and you want to see the textures and how, and then you sort of step back because it's not, it's only when you step back and, and all of, this, all of the, the prints are sort of four feet by six feet. That's pretty much sort of standard big size um, that Michael works in. So you needed to step back from them you know, to get the impact of just the, the shape and the configuration of the model. This piece right here is about the visit, uh, visiting home. It's been my experience, like, uh, you, the longer you stay in a space that you've never been to, you will see a black person sooner or later. You know, I mean, especially in, even in places where we're not even supposed to be there. I mean, we were in, I, I went to this a little conference, not a conference, uh, an artist retreat in, in the Ukraine. You know, Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> so it was about seven artists from the States living and working with seven artists from Russia and the Ukraine. But the longer we stayed there, sooner or later, we, we saw another brother. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this is about being in places where you traditionally aren't supposed to be. There's an Australia that did belong. This is in Maitland. It, 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 it was. It belonged to somebody else. And but, this story came after I did the whole image. Uh, I lifted these people from this exhibition in um, Camden. 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 Uh, and what, what island were they from? The, the Torres Strait Island people, who are people in the northern part of Australia, Aboriginal groups. So you you, you got to get yourself a wife to remember yeah, things. But one, of the, <laughs> one of the really interesting things is in their, in their culture, if a person is deceased, you eliminate visual references to that person. And all of the exhibits that we saw in the museums there would have a sign saying, Torres Strait Islanders, there are images, there, there are images of deceased people here, so just be aware of that fact. Mm -hmm. And some people chose not to see the exhibit because that was just uh, mm -hmm. you know, something they didn't do. So in the sense of appropriating those images and putting them in this very visible uh, sort of space of a colonial house, I, I think sometimes it would be interesting how, if this piece were to be shown in Australia, how it would be received. Yeah, but you would certainly want to, out of respect, you know, for those values, put uh, a warning that you would see deceased peoples. And these are two young girls who, who uh, their relatives used to stay in the house, and they come back to live in the house. Ingrid's? Ibises. Ibises. <laughs> uh, they're these big, huge ass birds. I mean, these birds are about this big. But they fly around like pigeons. And they they, 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 they walking around like, but it's a, they're like big. It, people think they're cute. That's because they got white wings, but they're ugly. They're <laughs> <laughs> very ugly birds. And uh, they, we were in the summer place that had lunch, and these things were just, they were just walking around. <laughs> About the size of turkeys, the small turkeys. Yeah. <coughs> this piece is, uh, that's the house my mother uh, grew up in and my cousin grew up in. Uh, it's in South South Cedo in, in New Orleans. I had a brother who, who was staying in the house when the, uh, her, and Katrina came through that. And so uh, I think that was the first time I've seen my mother cry. And uh, she told me, Go on down there, New Orleans. See if you can find your brother. I said, I'm in. I'm about 66 years old. We need to go find my brother. Like he's a little kid. You know, so I was told to do that. So Carol and I we went down there and to New Orleans to find him. Because what they did, they put people on the, on, the, on the bus. You didn't know where you were going. You did not know where you were going. He sent us a little note. He was in Tyler, Texas. Where the hell is Tyler, Texas? I'm like, 
So I went to Tyler, Texas. And then from there, we went to New Orleans to look at the house. And uh, the house was, was still standing there. But there was a lot of growth, uh, not growth, but uh, mold inside the house. And the mold forms a little pattern. In, uh, and there was also the, the other part that they don't talk about a lot, the stench from unclean refrigerators. And uh, I was talking to my brother, he said, uh, well, like most people, they, they guess right because the storm didn't hit them. But they didn't guess on the levee breaking. And he said, well, the water's, the water's coming. I think it's about time to leave. Because everything in the house was floating. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody went across the street to one fellow who had a duplex. And but to me, they, they did something, I guess, doing the right thing. Women and children first. The, but what they should have done is take families. Because a lot of people got separated yeah. and they couldn't find each other. The other thing I think that, that they, they should have done, I mean, you got on a bus and you went over to the stadium, the football stadium, and they, my brother said, no, you don't go in there. Don't go. Whatever you do, don't go in the stadium. Because all kinds of stuff was going on in the stadium. Yeah. So you stand outside and you get in line. If you got to do a number one and number two, you got to do it right there. If you get out of line, you ain't going to get back in line no more. So you got on the bus, and people went all over the United States. But how come they just didn't go to these military bases where everything was up? But it's easy to say these things in hindsight. So um, this piece is about overgrowth and a time traveler going back, visiting home again. The home will never be the same. This is uh, Twin 77. I met Twin 77. He was a... Uh, Very prolific um, contemporary Nigerian artist. And I, what I really met was the uh, fellow who was taking pictures of his artwork. And it's uh, um, Richard Green. And uh, yeah, Richard Green is kind of a comedian. He said, uh, damn, these African artists don't know what the right angle is. Because the, the camera was supposed to be square, but it wasn't quite square, because he had to square it up in, in, in his camera. And I said, who is this dude? Oh, that's 277. So I had uh, this friend of mine named Ezekiel Nelson had a uh, show of 277 at work in his, in his uh, gallery. And he was there, and I met him and talked to him. These were. What do you call it? Uh, henna. I had one model who was wearing these henna things all over her body. And, uh, but they were uh, utility, uh, fertility symbols. And I call them the little bugs just crawling on the body. And so I just always like you to just do one, just put these little things crawling all over one's body. So what I did is I think about working in Photoshop. You can lift something from one photograph and put it in another. So I lifted these little things and put it on this model right here. But I started to see the, the, the shape of the number, seven, seven. You know, so that's how these things come about. It, it, it's not in the beginning. It's in the process. It's in, it's in the process. Um, this is Morocco. Uh, this is another text from the back in Morocco. And uh, you know, people do graffiti, and they still call their names on trees. And that's what this one, a Moroccan tree. This is uh, sun shadows on a um, on Uluru. Uluru is that color, and it's huge. So this is uh, a mom, she's uh, doing a little number making sun shadows right there on the um, on Uluru, her sacred. Um, I had two pieces, this one and the one on this wall over here, they're really about train rides. Uh, I rode the train quite a bit in my life. I, I don't know anything about the South. I mean, nothing, zero. But for the longest period of time, once a year, we went all to New Orleans. And there's that was train in between. And New Orleans is a different place. You know, I don't care. It's a whole different world. But like when you ride the train, you see things. And uh, things pass you by. And I, and I like to catch glimpses of people while you're out of the train. Over the train and the station, the train takes off. That's what this reminds me of. It's the view from the train window. And this piece over here is the same thing. Almost like the view from the train window. This is a uh, low tide. I like water also. I love the fish. Um, Strange piece. I, I, I just knew it was right when I put it together. 
and uh, this was a, a beach. Where is that place? Where you go to? Ball Head Island. Was Ball Head Island? Was that another place? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was a place where was, we met, we met the whole set of black folks, and white people were stupid. Because yeah. you go fishing in there, you catch nothing but sharks. And then they had these canals where you but they do a lot of shrimping down there. And the canals come up, uh, they dredge canals, but you can, but the canal come right by the uh, place where they handle the shrimp. And in the canal, there are a lot of porpoises and they got these bull sharks. And you see the people working that place. Why right? can real stupid? They like to get in the water. But they had the beaches are long, long beaches. You know, so when the tide comes in, uh, the sand feels feels different. It's, it's really shallow when the tide moves, and that's why I really like this beach right here. It's, it's called Low Tide. You know, uh, I couldn't think of anything else to name, but I knew it was dumb. This is a Texas snowflakes. Snows are 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 are, are, are uh, really nice, especially if you're the first one in it. Go walking in the woods. And it don't have to be a lot of snow, but don't walk in a place with no other footprints. And you can see all the colors in the world, but and it's, it's kind of nice. It's really nice there in, in the snow. So I thought it'd be a good little place to put uh, the image. The image is larger than life, because she's a guy. She's from someplace else, but she's catching snowflakes. Question. Thank you. Thank you. This is, uh, before folks ask questions, I wanted to ask one other thing, a point of privilege here. Uh, let's look at this one. Let's look at this one. Uh, I stepped out while you were talking about it, but I love this. And I want to know, is the model from one of your students, or is it someone from uh, Australia? Oh, she's, she's a person from Howard. Uh, she's from Howard. But, and not no, from no, Australia. But she's from Australia. She's not from Australia. She's, um, a lot of these, these young ladies I, I, I know. You know, and, uh, I mean, you gotta know them. They, 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 they do things to me that they wouldn't do to anybody else. And I, I, don't worry about it. I'm not gonna take a picture of you like you can't show your mom. <laughs> don't bring your daddy. They, they, they don't bring him. <laughs> uh, but she started to dye her hair this color. And uh, she and I was really working. We had a good relationship. And once you start a good relationship with, with one model, they become your muse. They spring off a whole bunch of ideas. But then she decided to go to grad school and go to Delphi, so she's gone. Uh, there's a certain models, they just know what you, they feel what you want, and they just give it to you. And I don't have to do anything, I have to say anything. And she was that kind of person. Uh, very, very smart young lady. She's been doing um, uh, video performances in Philadelphia right now. And that's her boyfriend right there. You know. So I have a good relationship with these two. So uh, he would. <coughs> Let me see his girlfriend, but naked. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, I'm going to get paid too. He got paid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, questions, questions. Questions. Okay. So I, ordinarily, I would say, go on out there, drink some wine, come back here, and write me a check. <laughs> but, uh, you can still say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank you. Thing, two things. A couple of things, yeah. A couple of things, Sherry. First, Sherry there's this say. beautiful brochure that also gives us more information about the artists, too, as we try and absorb everything. Also, a couple of, of upcoming events. Uh, on Saturday, this Saturday, here at the Storm Center, 7.30, there's an evening of Mississippi Delta Blues with Howlin' Mad and Shy Perry. So that's a free concert, I believe. Yeah. Um, Everybody should be there. <laughs> and there's also Stone Center's Writers Discussion Series featuring Candace Watt Smith and her book Black Mosaic, The Politics of Pan Ethnic Diversity. And that is Thursday, February 5th at 3.30 at the Bulls Head Bookstore. And all of that information is also in the, um, the newsletter, which should be out on the table with a bunch of refreshments. And those that didn't get brochures when you walked in, they're right here. 
uh, at the front. But you're free to continue to look around. I just closed the door to keep the noise from outside from coming in, and I'll open back up. But I do have a please question. Uh, continue. Yes. I'm still soliciting the opinions and ideas and reactions. Uh, and it is, uh, I have written only one part of it. Uh, one, one bit out of the research I did on the port of Bordeaux, especially the specifically the 18th century port of Bordeaux, uh, which I will describe in my talk. The nature of the port, the identity of the port, the content, and there was constant contestation over those things when I took what I call um, educational exile to Bordeaux with my daughter. I decided we needed to eject from the violent city school she had and the violent language she heard and undergo the general brainwashing of acquiring another language <laughs> and going to a quiet place where this stuff wasn't going on. The craziness wasn't there. So I took I uh, got myself invited to the University of Bordeaux, named after Montesquieu and Montaigne. And, and um, as a, re as a uh, re uh, invited researcher and put her in school. And then as soon as and I had told them, I wanted to compare the teaching of African studies or black studies and we'll put in a more vague formulation to account for the black French. What if anything?